I want to start out this morning in a scripture that just got mentioned. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which cleans so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. We need to keep reminding ourselves this year to set our eyes on Jesus Christ. That's what we are doing, getting all eyes on Jesus Christ. And if you're looking for direction, if you're looking for purpose, if you are looking for hope in life, we have found that in Jesus Christ, and we want to help you see that in Jesus Christ. If you're looking at your past and you're bogged down by that, if you're finding that life is just too much, we want to help you see Jesus Christ, to fix your eyes on Jesus, to help with those things. And that's why we're spending these Sundays Uh, going up to Easter, looking at Jesus on purpose. He's not someone who just happened to live, and he came along and he made some ripples in history, and so today we're going to reflect on some of the ripples that Jesus made. He is God with us, remember from Christmas, for some very specific reasons. And we've been looking at those now for a few weeks. This is number four this week. And what we're talking about this morning is another purpose that Jesus just flat out stated as to why he came to earth, his journey. In one word, service. It's about doing good for others. Jesus said, I am among you as one who, go ahead, serves That means, simply put, if you're interested in Jesus Christ, you're interested in service. Did you hear that? If you're interested in Jesus Christ, you're interested in service. You can't separate those two things. It's easy to talk about serving, but when you sit down to write your schedule for the week or when you start to make regular commitments for the year, guess what? It's not as easy as it was just to talk about it. You'll see commercials A lot of them still these days, highlighting people volunteering. I hear them on the radio, people volunteering. You should volunteer. doesn't matter what you volunteer for, but you should volunteer. That's a great thing. The fact is, people are giving up their time, but that has dropped off. In the church, that has dropped off. And in the culture as a whole, we've seen that same thing. What I found, looking into some of the statistics about this is, that really almost the same number of people in the United States do volunteer work as they did in previous years, but people are devoting a whole lot less time than they did over the past 20 years. Look at the hours donated by volunteers uh, in a year in America. In 2000, uh, it was over, or 2002, it was over uh, 50 an, a year. This is per year average, all right? And then Come forward to this year, February of this year, a report showed it was somewhere closer to 20, just over. According to Gallup, 35% of Americans reported volunteering for a religious organization last year. That's down 38% in 2020, 44% in 2017. It just keeps dropping off. It doesn't hold the same priority that it used to in people's lives. Whatever the reason, the concept of serving others is fading. I wonder what the cause of that could be. So it's timely this morning, I think, that we would talk about serving. It's timely that we would talk about it in the purpose of Jesus, and we're going to look at a key verse in the book of Mark. So get your Bibles out, open up, please, to the Gospel of Mark, second book in the New Testament. Uh, That's on page 944. I'm not sure what page that's on in the Bibles that are in the pew. Um, but it's in there, second, second book in the New Testament. And let's say this up front. Following Jesus Christ means becoming a person who serves. We're even going to talk about a great day to serve that's coming up at Central Christian Church called Go Sunday. You've heard all about it already, and we're going to talk some more about that. We're also going to be so bold as to say that if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you're going to be a servant. Following Jesus means following his example of serving. 
And not everybody is going to fight to get in the front of the line on that, I know. And so in the spirit of a top ten list, by the way, do you remember top ten lists? Apparently those took too long, and so we quit hearing about them, but I considered what are some of the most common reasons that people come up with, creative reasons, for not serving. And I want to help you with those this morning. Maybe you can use some of these. Maybe you do use some of these. All right? For, here we go. Brr, drum roll. Top 10 list, 10 reasons not to serve. Uh, reason number 10. My position in life is too important. Okay. Well, here's one answer to that. Jesus was in the position of God before he came to earth, and that's pretty important, right? That's reason number 10. Whoop, let's go to number nine. Number nine, reason for not serving. Number nine, there is no guarantee it will turn out well. That's true, isn't it? Jesus did not have that guarantee. In fact, Jesus said most people would reject his service for them. Whoop, there goes that reason. All right, let's go to number eight. Reason number eight for not serving. You want me to serve people who don't deserve it. Answer, yes. So does Jesus, and so did Jesus. And Judas did not deserve to have Jesus wash his feet. You and I didn't deserve what Jesus did on the cross for us, amen? So there goes that reason. Let's go to number seven, reason not to serve. I'm not in a place in life where I'll do any good. Oh, now it's starting to sound like one you might use, right? Listen, Jesus' ministry directly reached only a very small percentage of humans. The point is not it has to serve everybody. Number six, I have too many other things to do. Now I've talked to everybody, right? Number six, I have too many other things to do. Well, Jesus was busy. In fact, Jesus came to die on the cross to save humanity. That was a pretty important job. It kept him pretty busy getting there. Number five, fifth reason not to serve. I don't feel like it. Okay. <laughs> Neither did Jesus. Let's go to number four. I'm already giving so much, I can't do any more. That does speak to some people today. Let me remind you of this. When Jesus needed it, God strengthened him to do more. Twice in the scriptures we read where angels came to strengthen him, to carry out the task. And that's where we get our strength, amen? So yes, you can. Not on your strength, but on God's, yes, you can. Number three, here's a reason not to serve. I'm afraid of what others will think. And I noticed this about Jesus, that he did his service right in the faces of those who misunderstood him the most. Number two, reason not to serve. What I get out of it won't make it worth the effort for me, capital M, capital E. Return on investment, all that. Jesus was the one who said it's more blessed to give than to receive. The greater blessing is in serving, not receiving. Here's the number one reason not to serve. Number one, service isn't my gift. Guess what? You're right. It's not. It is God's gift. It is God's gift that he is desiring to give through you. He owns it. Just like Jesus came to give and to serve, not to be served. So there you go. Ten reasons to come up with not to help on Go Sunday. Ten reasons not to serve. And if one of those works for you, you're dismissed. Let's keep going. <clears throat> when I consider all the reasons that I can think of not to serve, and I look at them in light of the work of Jesus, they don't sound as good as they did before. So I want us to get to Mark chapter 10, verse 45, and some other places this morning we're going to look, and we're going to try to come up with a right concept about this word, service or serving. It shows up in some form over 1,200 times in the Bible. So it must matter. I want to get a good idea of what is service, how we're supposed to look at it. Number one, service is this. It is what God expects us to do when he enables us. Parents, if you stay up with your son or daughter studying all night for a science test the next day, helping that young person get ready for life and want them to do well on a science test, if you're like me, what do you expect in return? 
Expect a good grade on the test, right? You expect something. And when we invest our time, our experience, our resources into somebody else, we expect them to do something with it. Otherwise, our effort is wasted. So what should God expect of his church? See, God has given us gifts. I know we've got you with a thumb in Mark chapter 10. Try Ephesians chapter 4 real quick. Where it says this, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's this list in Ephesians 4 of of gifts that God has given to his church. Spiritual gifts. And in the church, he's given people certain abilities, certain callings, certain positions of responsibility with the goal. Verse 12, did you see it? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, God gave these gifts to his church, and he expects a return. He expects something to happen. If he gave you the ability to lead or if he gave you a good leader who has prompted you to a specific service that you've been called to do or that you are able to do, then God is expecting that you will serve and that your service ultimately, like Paul says here, will build up the body of Christ. It's a great arrangement. He's not expecting you to do any more than he enables you to do, but he is expecting you to do what he has enabled you to do. Singer Kurt Kaiser, one time his dad told him, he he quoted this, whatever gift you have been given, it is your responsibility to burnish it, shine it, and make it the best it can be, then give it back to the one from whom you received it. So I want you to take a breath this morning, in case this whole subject of service makes you nervous. Hey, that rhymes. It's not all up to you. Every bit of service is not all up to you. God will enable us to do everything he wants us to do. Isn't that a relief? He's the one that's going to provide what we need to be able to do it. I have never found a place in Scripture where God says he expects his people to do more than he will give us the ability to do. Let me show you three real quick. Philippians 4.19. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Who will supply every need? God. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Who's that going to supply that? God. Philippians 1, 6. I'm sure of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Who started that good work in you? God. These are the confident words of the Apostle Paul who understood God would enable him to do exactly what God wants done. He also realized that God expected him to do it. Jesus told a lot of parables to help us understand this concept. One of the the best ones, I think, that really points it out is in Matthew chapter 25. We call it the parable of the talents Remember the story, it's a a king who goes on a journey and he leaves some of his money with three of his trusted servants. And when he comes back, he wants to see what all three have done with the things he left with them. And there are a lot of things to learn from that story, but one that's really evident to me is that he expects his servants to put his resources to work. Whatever it is that God enables you to do, he is expecting you to use it to serve. So that's the the number one thing. Service is God expecting a return from what he gives us, all right? Here's the second thing service is. Hang on to Mark 10. Here's the second thing. Service is the example set by Jesus. And I need to make this clear that when Jesus came to earth, it wasn't just to be our, our great example. The mission of Jesus was not, I have come to just be a great example for you. All right? It's much bigger than that. There are a lot of features of the life of Jesus, by the way, that we can't imitate. I don't work miracles. I can't die for the sins of the world. I don't start a world movement. Jesus did those things. We can't. 
But there's one central feature of the life of Jesus that we can do and that we should do. There is one example that we especially should follow. Guess what that is? Being a servant. Jesus taught a lot about being a servant. Jesus showed a lot about being a servant. And that's why we had a a top ten list at the beginning of this message. It was to help us see that that's the example of Jesus that we need to follow. All right, Mark 10. The backdrop of, of this key verse of the whole gospel of Mark, Mark 10, 45. The backdrop is a story created by James and John and mom. James and John the brothers, and their mother, Mrs. Zebedee, Zebedee's wife, when they came to Jesus with a special request, hey, why not? Doesn't hurt to ask. Hey, Jesus, I'm paraphrasing, would it be okay if James and John sat by you next to your throne in heaven? Just in case it's a first-come, first-served basis thing, we'd like to get their names in. And Jesus points out to them First of all, they don't realize what they're asking for. And secondly, he very patiently tells them about the nature of his ministry, his work. Those places are already reserved. Word gets around, and guess what? The other ten are incensed. Who are these two guys? Thinking that they deserve the place next to Jesus. What about us? (laughs) That's the background. Chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant." And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the verse. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' example says, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how many people are under your authority at work, or who you influence in your peer group, doesn't matter how many people are followers of you on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, doesn't matter how high your rank is, the Son of God repeatedly, deliberately placed himself in a position of service. The Son of God. What would Jesus do? Answer, he would serve. That's the answer. Some years later, it was John, in the 13th chapter of his gospel, John chapter 13, who shows Jesus taking on the role of the lowest of servants by washing the feet of his disciples. Remember that in John 13. It's at the Last Supper. And it says there that the the, the backdrop is being set by John uh, chapter 3. I love the way he sets this up. It says Jesus, it doesn't say Jesus realized how lowly he was. Jesus realized he really wasn't going to get much done. Or Jesus realized that everybody was better than him. It says Uh, Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, knowing that, Jesus rose from supper and took a towel and put it around his waist and filled a basin with water and proceeded to wash the filthy feet of his disciples. Then he says in verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And I want to ask you this morning, how are you doing at following the example of Jesus about being a servant? Gordon MacDonald said, you can tell whether you are becoming a servant by how you act when people treat you like one. Hmm. 
See, service has nothing to do with your status. It sure didn't in Jesus' case. It has nothing to do with the worthiness of the people you serve. Judas Iscariot was not worthy of Jesus, the Son of God, washing his feet. It has nothing to do with where you are or where you aren't in life. All of that dissolved when God took on human flesh and became not just a human, but became a humble human who served. Service is the example set by Jesus. Here's something else service is. Service given to others is a way of giving to Jesus. I like that. I don't know if you've been reading up on it, but the collective mental health of the world has just gone in the last three years. That's the technical term. <laughs> Experts are still trying to measure what has happened. Um, Great Britain, there is a study done, antidepressant prescriptions have increased every year for the last six years, 35% more than it was six years before. Keeps getting worse. Some years back, Dr. Carl Menninger, world-famous psychiatrist, had given a lecture about mental health, and at the end of his lecture, he was taking questions from people, and somebody asked a question to Dr. Menninger, Doctor, what if somebody felt he was going to have a nervous breakdown? What would you recommend to that person? And everybody thought he'd say, well, you know, be sure to get professional help, be sure to seek counseling, those kinds of things. Here's what Dr. Menninger said. Lock up your house. Go across the railroad tracks, find someone in need, and do something to help that person. There's a word for that. Service. See, our lives are supposed to be given over to Jesus and live for him. Amen? And I can just tell you this morning, whoever you are, until your life is yielded to Jesus Christ, until your life is given over to him, there's going to be something inside of you that feels unfulfilled. There's going to be something about this life that you're always going to be wishing there was more or something different or something better. It will just always feel that way. Because our lives are designed to be given over to him. And when we serve other people, that service really is being given to Jesus. And that's the reason when we serve that it makes us healthier, more fulfilled people. Because in that act, we are yielding our lives to our Lord. Serving other people is service given to Jesus. I read several different accounts, and I find this true. You, know, you go digging for information and stories and things, and then you find six versions of it. And I at least guess, okay, it probably really happened. I just can't tell it with great detail. But the story is told about Mother Teresa, and this isn't surprising to me, working in Calcutta, India, and one day she's there on the streets of Calcutta, and she is tending to the festering wounds of a person who had leprosy. Not a pretty picture. And there she is knelt down working on this person, and someone, a tourist with a camera, came up behind her and said, Mother Teresa, may I take your picture? And she said, sure, without looking up. And so this lady takes her picture and, and whispers to the person next to her, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And Mother Teresa heard it, and she didn't look up again, and she said, neither would I. You want a reason to care about children? You want a reason to care about the people who are down and out? You want a reason to care about the humblest person that you could find? Let me give you a reason from Mark chapter 9, right before Mark 10. They're arguing about who's great. It says, sitting down, verse 35, Jesus called the 12 and he said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them, taking him in his arms. He said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Your attitude in this, the way you serve, is given to Jesus. 
Matthew 25, Jesus said at the end of the parable of the sheep and the goats, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So whenever we serve in the name of Jesus, there is something like Brian described earlier today. There's something holy going on. There is something higher going on than just, hey, I'm doing something nice for somebody and it makes me feel good. It is, Jesus says, as if we were serving Jesus himself. Isn't that incredible? That's the part where you nod and go, well, that's incredible. It's amazing. If Jesus needed some help, think about it this morning. If if Jesus needed some help, he came here physically this morning, would you give him help? If he needed you to help him find his way to a disciple hour class, hey, I hear there's a great class. I hear Steve Hornbeck's a great teacher. I'd love to go hear him teach. Would you help him find Steve's class? If Jesus went out to the parking lot and his car wouldn't start, would you give him a jump start for his car? Would you help him fix his broken mower? Would you help him get someplace he needed to go? Would you help Jesus if he were here? Well, of course. There are times that we need to remember these words. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. All right, last Sunday of April, April 30th, we are going to have a Go Sunday. You know what Go stands for? It stands for Go. It is a Sunday for Central Christian Church, this church family that I love, to serve others in a variety of ways. And we are gathering those opportunities to figure out how can we do this well in our community, some ways that maybe we have never done before and you have never done before. And it's not going to be comfortable and it's going to be all those other top 10 things, and that's okay. It's time to go. It's time to serve. Brian asked for some suggestions where you could see this doing some good. And I want to encourage you this week, keep your eyes open. Watch for your neighbors. Watch in your community. Watch where you work. Watch around school, at your job. See all those around you as opportunities to do jobs. Things that other people avoid because they're jobs that take a servant's heart. And guess what? There is a shortage on people with hearts like that. There are plenty of people who view Christ followers, by the way, as self-serving elitists who turn our noses up at anybody who doesn't belong. There are a lot of people think that this place where you come on Sunday morning is where people gather together because they're goody goodies and they retreat for the purpose of patting each other on the back and saying how stupid everyone else is. Maybe we have partly earned that kind of reputation. Maybe that's not a fair reputation. Regardless of that, that is how some people perceive Christians. I'd like to change that perception. You know what would change that? One thing I think that would change that is if the people of Rockford saw people of Central Christian Church doing acts of service with Jesus' name attached to it, not for themselves, but for the sake of being like their Savior and serving other people. Could you picture the way that negative perceptions about the church and about individual Christians could be turned around? Just picture that for a moment, how that could be changed. In the skeptical minds of people that you have heard speak poorly about Christians, picture it for a minute, and as you do, picture the part that you can have in doing that, and then be able to say after it's done, hey, I had a hand in that. I got to be part of that. Go Sunday, that's just one idea. You know, but it is one where I really want to encourage every person here to find your place. The reason for it is to serve Jesus by serving other people for whom Jesus died. What a great opportunity. Amen? What a great thing that can be. And if you're thinking to yourself, does service really make that big of a difference? Well, then I want to, I want to end up here with a story this morning. And I want to ask you to pay close attention to this story because it's, I've got to give it to you. It's a, it's a little bit of a journey to get to the end, okay? It happened to a guy named Doug Nichols. What a great name. Um, Doug Nichols lives in Washington. 
I'd never met him. He's not a relation that I know of. But I did track him down, and Doug is 80 now. And this story came from his early work as a missionary, clear back in the 1960s. He was in India. It was 1967. And he was serving with a group called Operation Mobilization. And his presence there in India, as he served, made him one of the many people in India who developed tuberculosis. So he found himself in a, a sanitarium for people who had tuberculosis in India, confined there for several months. He didn't speak the language at the time. But he still tried to pass out Christian literature. He had some tracts and books, booklets and stuff, so he tried to pass those out to people in their language, the patients, the doctors, the nurses, all of them politely refused. He could tell that some of them were not really happy about the rich American who was in the sanitarium there for free in India. If only they had known, he said, that he was as broke as they were. And the first few nights, tuberculosis is a lung disease, the first few nights, he woke up around 2 a.m. having coughing fits. And so he was there coughing. And one morning during that coughing fit, he noticed one of the older, sicker patients who was across the aisle from him trying to get up out of his bed. This old man would rise up and get to the edge of his bed, and he was trying to get up, and then he would get exhausted. He'd finally fall back into his bed and just kind of softly cry. Couldn't tell what he was doing. And so the next morning, he realized what this man had been trying to do. He'd been trying to get up to walk to the bathroom. There was this stench in the ward. And all the other patients were mad. In fact, the nurses, as they cleaned him up, were saying horrible things to him. One of them even slapped him. And this little old man just kind of curled up then in his bed crying. Next morning came, 2 a.m. Doug Nichols is up coughing again. He looks over and he sees this little old man, same thing, trying to get up out of his bed. Doesn't have the strength because he's so advanced in his disease, can't even get up out of his bed. And Doug didn't want to get involved, but he said like, he just got up. He went over to this old man who had given up again. He says when he placed his hand on him, his eyes opened up in terror. And then he just smiled at him. And he took him up in his arms. This man was so small that he could carry him. And he carried him to the bathroom there in their ward. He said it was nothing more than a, a filthy room with a hole in the ground. And he stood behind this little old man as he did what he needed to do. And he picked him back up and carried him back to his bed and put him in his bed. And this, this man, he says, took his face and gave him a kiss on his cheek and said something to him. He didn't know what it was because it was in the language he didn't speak. But that morning, uh, as the sun came up and new morning was beginning, another patient was waking up Doug, handing him a cup of hot tea. He mentioned with his hands he would like one of the tracks that Doug was trying to pass out before. So he gave him one. And as the sun came up and the day started, other patients started coming in, talking to him and indicating to him they also wanted these tracts that he was passing out, some of the booklets he had. Throughout the day, he says, nurses, interns, doctors were all coming to him asking for literature. Some weeks later, an evangelist who spoke the local language visited Doug, and as he talked to others, he discovered that several of these people who had made contact in Doug's life were to the point where they wanted to accept Jesus as a result of the literature he had passed out to them. And Doug says this, what did it take to reach these people with the gospel? It wasn't health, the ability to speak their language, or a persuasive talk. I simply took a trip to the bathroom. If you could carry an old man to the bathroom and you knew as a result of that that several people would live with Jesus forever in heaven, would you do that? Service isn't always glamorous. It's not always real successful. It's not always easy or simple. But service is always a way that the people of God can demonstrate the love of God to a skeptical world. 
It's always following the footsteps of our Lord because he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I want to tell you this morning, whoever you are online, here in person, you are one of the many for whom Jesus gave his life. He came to serve you, and the greatest act of service he did was offering his life in your place, in my place. And this morning, I don't want that act of service to go to waste. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is Lord in your life, and that's up to you to make that choice, to allow him that place that he deserves in your life. Maybe this morning you've been thinking, that's the thing I need to do. I've finally heard what it is. I need to give up my life to Jesus. If that's you and you're ready to become a Christian, we're excited to invite you to take the steps to become a follower of Christ. Jesus said there's some things you need to do. You need to acknowledge who he is. You need to be willing to say that. You need to come to grips with that in your life. You need to be willing to say goodbye to your old way of living because you were living for other things, not for him, and now it's time to turn. Repentance, that's called. You need to be baptized into him. Jesus gave us this thing that we can do that's a great visual, but it is also the time when God says, you bury that old person who dies, and a new person is raised up to live for him. We're excited to invite you to do that today, and we can do that right here. If you're online and joining us, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we would love for you to contact the church and say, hey, this is a decision that I'm ready to make. What do I need to do? And I'm saying, I'm glad you asked that. You need to do that. cccrockford.org slash connect. Fill out one of our connect cards or contact us at the office by phone or by email. And let us please establish a, a, a relationship with you that can help you become a follower of Jesus with us. A group of people who are going to go serve. All right, let's stand up together, and this morning we're going to pray together. We're going to uh, invite people to come if you're ready to accept Christ. And let me say this also. Maybe in your life you're just facing struggles or there are some things that you want somebody to come alongside you and just pray with you. It would be very fitting. It would be very appropriate. It is always welcomed at the end of our time of worship for you to just come forward here. And we've got our elders and staff here. We've got other people who are, I will call them prayer warriors. They would step alongside you and sit down with you and, and be glad to spend some time praying with you today. So if that's a need in your life, this time is a time to do that too. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that Jesus came not only to give his life for us, but in looking at it, we can see the example of the perfect servant. We recognize, Lord, it goes contrary to our flesh. We want to serve ourselves. We want to protect and preserve ourselves. But I pray today that you will help us like Jesus to have uh, a greater heart for the joy of serving you by serving others. Father, help us as a church family to be unafraid of doing this there may not be a great return. There may not be immediate results. It, it won't be glamorous. But Lord, we want you to be pleased with us. And so I pray today that we can, in a greater way, take on the heart of Jesus. Especially pray for those who haven't yet made uh, that decision to pass over from death to life, to take on what Jesus has won for them when he hung on the cross and said, it is finished. Lord, I pray today there will be decisions made, the decisions that shape our lives for the rest of the days that you give us here on earth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.